Hello, I'm really sorry I can't be there in person today, but I am there in the chat. And either way, it's lovely to be back at State of the Browser again. My name is Leanne Watson, and I'm going to be talking about accessibility and spanners, obviously. Before I do that, though, I want to make sure something is understood. This talk is going to focus a lot on code and development, but accessibility is everybody's responsibility. Whether you're a business analyst, a product owner, project manager, content editor, user researcher, interaction specialist, designer, developer, QA, tester, essentially, if you are in any way, shape, or form involved in creating things that humans interact with, you've got a responsibility to think about accessibility. From a development point of view, it's useful to treat it as part of your toolkit. When we write code, we need it to be secure, to respect privacy, to be resilient, performant, and accessible. In other words, it's just one of the things we do when we're doing our job properly, that we should take pride in doing and look back at the end of the day and think, yep, yeah, good job, nice work. So when it comes to code, how does accessibility fit in? Well, quite simply, it's all about cause and effect. Who knew that one of Newton's laws of motion would have anything to do with code development? But it's true, it does. The code that we write has a very direct impact on the usability of the experience for quite a few different people. Pretty much anybody who uses a keyboard instead of a mouse, and anyone who uses assistive technologies like screen readers or speech recognition. So when we think about writing code, it can often seem like accessibility is just this big bag of spanners. It's all very well me saying cause and effect, but what does that really mean? And more to the point, how do we actually do it? The answer comes in four things, mechanics, semantics, interaction, and then construction. So onwards, what does this actually mean? Mechanics, uh, mechanics in the browser is essentially all the things that happen under the hood to make accessibility work in practice from a code point of view and from an assistive technology point of view. As I mentioned just now, assistive technologies that depend on accessibility in terms of code quality include speech recognition tools and screen reader users. I'm a screen reader user myself, so I'm going to use screen readers as many of the examples as we go through, but do bear in mind that screen readers are not the only assistive technologies. So what is this browser mechanics, accessibility mechanics that I keep talking about? Well, it begins with the idea of platform accessibility APIs. They exist on all platforms. On screen, there are some of the desktop, laptop operating system examples. It began with Microsoft Active Accessibility in 1997 that works through the iAccessible interface. And over the years, we've gained iAccessible 2, which extends MSAA for Windows, and more recently, UI Automation. On macOS, we've got NS Accessibility Protocol, and Linux through the GNOME desktop has the ATSPI, or Assistive Technology Service Provider interface. They're also available on mobile platforms too. But the TLDR is that all platforms have these accessibility APIs. The bad news is they are not JavaScript APIs. We can't use them as developers. They are the exclusive domain of assistive technologies that can use them to ask for accessibility information about what's on screen. That might be information in the operating system interface, an application interface, or in the case of a browser, the content that the browser renders inside itself. So what does that mean? Well, when a browser loads up a page, it gets busy. It does a whole ton of stuff in the blink of an eye. It creates the DOM. It kicks the graphics engine into action and creates what's visually rendered on screen. And if an assistive technology is detected, it also creates another structure known as the accessibility tree. You can take a look at this through your dev tools if you're curious. But the accessibility tree contains all sorts of really good accessibility information about what's visually rendered on screen. So think of it as the non-visual equivalent of what many of you will be looking at on screen. 
So that brings us to the next part of our toolkit and semantics. What is all that accessibility information that's available in the accessibility tree? Every time a screen reader or another assistive technology wants to query it using the platform accessibility APIs. Well, there are two kinds of semantics. There are implicit semantics that you get when you use HTML elements and attributes. It's a bit like a promise. When you use an HTML element or an attribute, you're making a commitment that says this thing is effectively what it says it is. But we can also explicitly apply semantics using ARIA. So implicit semantics that come with HTML by default and explicit semantics that can be applied using ARIA. Let's take a look at some examples. The first bit of semantic information is an element's role. This is what it describes what it does, like someone's role in life does. You might be a teacher or a pilot or a parent, any of those things. It essentially says something about what you are. It's the same with HTML elements. They mostly all have implicit roles that say what they are. If we take a very simple example in the form of a button element, but an element with no content, literally just the tag itself, it has an implicit role of button. So when my screen reader finds one of these on a page and it says to the browser, hey, give me the accessibility information about this element, the first thing that comes back is its role. And as a user, I get to understand that this thing is a button. <laughs> Simple as that. So it's the first piece of the puzzle that tells me what it is I'm dealing with, something that will probably be obvious as you're taking the page in at a glance. The next bit of useful accessibility semantics is the name or accessible name. This is what describes uh, which the element is, or it's what differentiates one type of an element on a page from another, much like our names do. If you have a group of humans together, one of the ways we tell each other apart is because we have different names or mostly have different names. So if we extend our example by putting some text inside the button element, that's how a button element gets its accessible name. It's from what goes inside the two ends of the tag. There are now two bits of information that get made available to me as a screen reader user. The implicit role of the element and its accessible name. Show password button. So now I've got two useful bits of information. I know what this thing is and that gives me some clues about how I'll be able to interact with it. And I know what it's for. It's a show password button. The next bit of information, semantically speaking, is the state of an element, the current condition that it's in, if indeed, of course, it has a condition, not all elements do, and some of them you know, don't always have a particular state, but it's useful information when it's appropriate. There isn't a way in HTML to indicate when a button is in a pressed state or not. So here we've got our first example of explicitly applied semantics using the ARIA pressed attribute. It can have a value of true or false, indicating whether the button is pressed or not pressed. And so now there are three bits of information that are available. The role, the name, and the state of this particular element. Show password toggle button pressed. So what you might have heard there is that actually the role of the element also changed because of the explicitly applied state. The implicit role of a button element is just a button but we've now changed it to be toggle button because it's a button that can be well, toggled on or off. So again, those layers of very simple bits of information starting to build up to be really quite useful. We can take another example and the nav element. This has an implicit role of navigation. So again, a screen reader can query that information from the browser and tell the user when they're entering and exiting this particular part of the page. Navigation region. Navigation region ends. A quick word about the use of the word region there. This is the JAWS screen reader and it chooses to call these areas of the page regions. Header and footer, main are other examples. If we were listening to another screen reader like NVDA, it calls them landmarks. This is perfectly okay. I might say hello, you might say hey, somebody else might say hi. We all say it a little differently, but we all mean pretty much the same thing. 
and it's the same with screen readers. They all do pretty much the same thing. They might do it a little bit differently through, but it's okay and really nothing to worry about. You'll get used to it. We can extend this though. We can give our navigation block an accessible name. If you've got multiple nav elements on a page, this is a really good way to help screen reader users in particular understand the different purposes of those navigation regions. So again, we can uh, sorry, explicitly apply the accessible name, this time using ARIA label. And we're going to decide that this one is uh, a website navigation block. So now the information conveyed to the user changes a little bit. Website navigation region. Website navigation region ends. We now know which kind of navigation or what purpose of this particular nav block is all for. One thing to mention here is that inside your ARIA label attribute, in this case, you don't want to include the word navigation. I see this happening a lot in examples out in the wild. We've already got that information from the implicit role of the nav element. So if I had put website navigation inside the ARIA label attribute, it would have caused a bit of duplication. The announcement would have been something like website navigation, navigation region. And that just gets noisy and a little bit messy from, from the user experience point of view. Inside a nav block, it's pretty common to see lists. And again, here we've got both role, name and state building up together. Every type of list item, with, uh, sorry, list element, whether it's an ordered, unordered, or definition list, has the same role. It's just an implicit role of list. List items also have an implicit role of list item, and they get their accessible name from the content inside the element. State here takes a slightly different form, though. The browser counts up the number of list items inside the parent list and makes that information available as some details about the state of the list itself. So the experience sounds like this. List of three items. Bullet, role, bullet, name, bullet, state, list ends. And so we've got that nice package of information. If this had been an ordered list instead of an unordered one, we might have heard one, two, and three, or A, B, and C, instead of bullet, bullet, bullet. But the idea is essentially the same. There are a number of list items inside a list, and we've got all that information courtesy of the role name and state semantics. If we pull this all together now into uh, a combined design pattern for a navigation block, we start to understand how layering all these information, uh, bits of information together, putting all these different elements together, starts to convey an awful lot of really quite useful information. This is a nav block though, so this time we're throwing links into the mix too. An anchor element has an implicit role of link, and that gets announced. And this time, we've shifted the accessible name to be inside the anchor element, which is itself inside the list item. So the whole lot now sounds like this. Website navigation region. List of two items. Home. Link. About. Link. List ends. Website navigation region ends. So it's great. Information that to a sighted person is easily available at a glance is now easily available for a little bit of listening thanks to that semantic information. But there's a little bit more we can do to make this pattern just a bit better. For many years, we've been visually indicating which link in a navigation block is representative of the page that's currently displayed. We hacked around it trying to find a way to do the same thing semantically, but it wasn't until the ARIA current attribute arrived that we had a really nice, elegant way of doing it. With a value of page, we can now indicate the state of one of the list items containing a link inside the nav block that just conveys that same sense of information that's available visually. Website navigation region. List of two items. Home. Link. Current page. About. Link. List ends. Website navigation region ends. It's great, all that semantic information just coming together to form a nice holistic experience. Let's take a look at some forms. These are often interesting areas when it comes to semantics. Here we've got a couple of radio buttons. Uh, we've got input elements with a type of radio. It's the type uh, attribute that gives these inputs their implicit roles. In this case, it'll come as no surprise to discover uh, that these input with a type of radio have an implicit role of radio. 
The accessible names come from a slightly different source in these examples, though. Previously, we've seen accessible names from the inside of the element, like button and list item. We've seen it come from attributes, like aria label. Here, the accessible name for these form fields does come from the content inside an element, but it's not the element itself. It's the label element. And to make this work, we have to create an association between the two things. This is the for attribute on the label element and the ID attribute on the corresponding form field with exactly the same value. If that association isn't made in the code, the browser doesn't recognize that the label has anything to do with the form field at all. And so when the screen reader comes querying the accessibility tree for information, that relationship is AWOL. So those two attributes are vitally important. But when that association is made, then again, we get the accessible role and name information being communicated by the screen reader. Purple radio button not checked. One of two. Red radio button not checked. Two of two. And we even had some state information thrown in for good luck. We heard that both of those radio buttons were unchecked. If we'd have put the checked attribute onto either one of them, then we'd have heard that it was, in fact, checked. We also heard that there were two radio buttons in the set. That bit of state information comes courtesy of the name attribute, again, with the matching values for every radio button. So again, we know exactly what it is we're doing and the choice that we're making between red and purple, except we don't know why we're making that choice. So again, we can elevate this design pattern, and this time we're going to use a field set element. If we plonk those radio buttons and their associated labels inside a field set, which has an implicit role of group, we indicate that whatever is inside that group, that field set, is related in some way. It's grouped together. If we put the legend element as the first child of field set, it gives that group an accessible name. So now we have a group of things with an accessible name. And inside it, there are two radio buttons, each with their own accessible name. And all the roles and state information come together to create an experience like this. Group start, choose a color. Purple radio button not checked. One of two. Red radio button not checked. Two of two. Group end. So it's great when the screen reader moves on to that first radio button now, they get the contextual question, you know, choose between a color or the instruction, and then all the information about the choices that are available to them. And the experience really is pretty seamless. And from a development point of view, this is all happening for free. The browser is just taking care of business and supplying the necessary information via the accessibility tree to assistive technologies. Data tables are another really cracking example of all this working really well together. Yet they're often cited as being a pretty terrible thing to experience with a screen reader. I have to disagree. When you get a nice, well-constructed data table, they're an absolute delight to use. And the reason is that there's just so much information there for the taking. We've got a table element that has an implicit role of table. The caption element gives the table its accessible name, so we know what the reason the table is there for. Then we've got the TR and TD elements. And the browser, like it did with lists and list items, counts up those elements and lets it be known how many rows and columns the table has got. As you move around, you'll see that there's content inside the TDs, and that gives the TD elements their accessible names. The really great thing about data tables is the TH element, though. If you're a sighted person and you're using a data table, you will probably scan vertically up and down columns and horizontally left and right through rows. And as your focus moves onto a cell in the middle of the table, you might just casually flick your glance up or left to remind yourself which row or column you're in. Screen readers have shortcuts that let you do exactly that, move up and down through columns, left and right through rows. And as your focus moves into a particular cell, it will automatically speak the row or column header automatically to give you that context again. The best way I can show you this is with an example of someone navigating up and down and left and right through some of the columns in that table. Table with three columns and four rows. Average daily tea and coffee consumption. Column one, row one, person. Jokey, row two. Aisha, row three. 
coffee, 1 cup, column 2. Tea, 2 cups, column 3. Leone, 25 cups, row 4. <laughs> and that is on a slow day, trust me. So again, role, name, and state semantics coming together courtesy of accessibility mechanics in the browser. Now, I'm going to pause a moment. If you're sitting there listening and thinking, yep, but I don't write HTML code anymore. I'm a JavaScript developer. I use a framework, a component library, whatever, and, and it spits out all this HTML for me. Why do I need to care about all this? And the answer is that to turn your bag of spanners into a usable toolkit, you have to understand about the quality of the HTML that your chosen JavaScript framework is producing. Sometimes you're going to have to know how all this stuff works in order to be able to fix it and polyfill it, because much as I wish it were otherwise, there are a few JavaScript frameworks that really get much of this right, never mind all of it right. So sad to say, a lot of this responsibility is going to come down to you. So it's important to understand how this stuff works so that you're able to fix it through whichever JavaScript you prefer to use. It's a bit like, uh, you know, I'm imagining you're all capable of writing without the use of a keyboard. You're probably uh, all capable of doing some basic arithmetic without the use of a computer or, or a calculator. It's kind of the same idea. It helps to understand how the basics of your craft or the thing you want to do works. So you can do the more advanced stuff through the mechanisms and quicker, in this case, iterative development practices you prefer to use. But let's keep going. The next step is interaction. So as I say, we've looked at mechanics, we've looked at the semantics. What of the interaction? And specifically here, I want to talk about keyboard interaction. And again, we have this idea of implicit support and explicit support. When we use interactive elements in HTML, things like links and buttons and form fields and details and summary, uh, there is implied keyboard support. In other words, when you use those elements, you know that keyboard support is going to be provided by the browser. You don't need to do anything. Then there is explicit keyboard support. When you start to change the way HTML elements are used to customize them, even a little bit sometimes, then you assume responsibility for making sure that the keyboard support is properly provided. Let's go back to a button example. This time uh, we'll imagine a play button straightforward uh, button with an accessible name. It's text inside it. Remember, we've got the implicit role of the element, which is button. So that's all set up quite nicely. And all we need to do is just add a little bit of JavaScript to listen out for a mouse click events. And the browser will take care of everything else for us, uh, which is to say, if someone comes along with a keyboard, they can use the tab key to focus on it, the first step in being able to interact with anything with the keyboard. and they can then choose to use either the space key or the enter key to activate it because that's what buttons do. It's how they work. And the browser does that and then triggers the same functionality that you've applied in your script for the click event handler. So again, lots of stuff being taken care of through the accessibility mechanics just to work for keyboard users. There are times though, as I said, when you need to explicitly apply some keyboard support. A really common pattern that we see, not least actually in JavaScript framework code, is that actually a thing that may well be styled to look like a button is actually a link under the hood. So in this case, uh, it's a link with an href attribute, and that's really important. It's the href attribute that makes a link focusable. So in this particular pattern, uh, a keyboard user can at least use their tab key to focus on the pseudo button. So far, so good. Problem is that links can only be activated using the enter key, whereas, as I just mentioned, the expectation is that buttons can be activated using enter or space. So here's where our first bit of explicitly applied keyboard support kicks in. We need to script a listener for the key code for the space key, which is 13, and to trigger the expected function when that key code is detected. The browser will handle the enter key automatically because that's how links work. And otherwise, everything is now pretty much all in working functional order. Unless, and we see this a lot too, that href attribute isn't present. 
without the href attribute, the browser actually doesn't do anything at all with links. Uh, it might as well be a span element to all intents and purposes. So it can't be focused on with the keyboard. We can use the tab index attribute with a value of zero to remedy that though. And we then need to provide all the keyboard support as well as, of course, the mouse support. So we need to listen out for both the space and enter keys, 13 and 32 in terms of key codes, and trigger the expected functionality when either is detected or, of course, a mouse click and the same functionality. There's one thing we've overlooked, though, in all of this, and it goes back to that idea of semantics. If you remember back a ways, the implicit role of an anchor element is link, yet this thing looks like a button, it functions like a button, it's just that to a screen reader user, they're being told it's a link, and that sets up all kinds of wrong expectations, not least in terms of which keys you can use to interact with it. So we have to go back to that idea of explicitly applied semantics, this time using the role attribute, again, uh, with a value of button, to complete the whole package. So now we have accessible role, name, and the appropriate keyboard and mouse interaction. And you might well be thinking, that's an awful lot of extra code just to make a button work. And you're absolutely right. And this is very much often what we find to be true. The further away you move from anything that has implicit semantics or implicit interaction support, the more code you have to write, and that means the more brittle your thing is. So wherever and wherever possible, it's always worth keeping things as simple as you possibly can. It doesn't always work like that in practice, admittedly, though. Not least because there are some times when you want to build something that doesn't exist in HTML, and that's what we're going to do now. The idea of construction bringing your mechanics, your semantics, and your interaction together in a construct that takes all of them working seamlessly together in order to create a good user experience. We're going to create a menu bar. So we'll start off with our basic building blocks of good HTML. We're going to use lists with a child list uh, full of list items, and each of those list items contains a link. This simply means that we've got good fallback here. If for any reason uh, JavaScript fails out, latency is a thing, uh, then this is resilience at work here. This fallback will actually work. It will have implied semantics that will serve screen read as well. It will have functionality and it will make sense and be functional even under the worst conditions. So that's our starting point. Then we can start explicitly overriding the natural semantics that are present in the HTML. We're going to override pretty much all the roles in this pattern because we don't want the user to think they're interacting with a set of nested lists. We want the user to think they're interacting with a menu bar. That's what it's going to look like and that's how it needs to be semantically too. So we will override the implicit list role on the list element with a role of menu bar. We'll override the link role of the anchor elements with the role of menu item, because now they will become items inside the menu. And the child menu will have a role of menu. If you're wondering why the list items have had their roles overridden too, but with a role of none, the reason is that the list construct is useful as our fallback HTML. But in the menu bar construct, we don't need that semantic information to be exposed to users. So by giving it a role of none, we're saying, look, while these roles are being applied, uh, treat that list item as though it had no role. It sort of vanishes it from screen readers, if you like. Then we can think about accessible names. Actually, the accessible names that were there in the HTML inside the links still stands good. Uh, it will still serve as the accessible name for the menu items, but we can add an accessible name for the construct itself, for the whole menu bar, using the aria label attribute. I've gone for blog taxonomy because that's what this menu bar is all about. And we're also going to give uh, the submenu an accessible name of categories, just to indicate what the purpose or the nature of that particular submenu is. Lastly, we're going to add in some state information because visually it will be important to understand when a menu is open and closed, but quite straightforward. So we have to do the same thing semantically speaking. Again, we can apply this explicitly using the aria expanded attribute. If 
value of true or false, depending on whether the menu is open or closed or not. So we have got our good quality HTML. We have explicitly provided a whole bunch of semantic information, and we know that courtesy of the accessibility mechanics in the browser, it's all going to create a really great experience, right? Well, here's what happens. Menu, category, submenu, one of two. So off to a terrific start. We knew it was a menu, and we know there was a categories submenu, and that it was one of two, which implies that there is another part of this menu bar that we could access, except we can't because there's no keyboard support. This construct doesn't exist in HTML, so the browser doesn't know what keyboard support and interaction or any other kind of interaction needs to be provided, which brings us back to that third point of explicitly applied keyboard support. In other words, you need to provide the expected keyboard interaction. In the simplest sense for a menu bar, it needs to be that the space or enter keys will open or close an element, a uh, child menu, that the arrow keys left, right, and up and down will let you move along the menu bar or up and down through the menus. And if you hit the escape key, that it will close any open menu that you happen to be on and return your focus back up to the parent element. There's actually a ton more you can do in terms of keyboard support for this kind of menu bar construct, but that's the basics, the core that you've really got to get in place. And so when we bring that third piece into the equation, the interaction, we get now a fully fledged and properly working menu bar. Menu, category submenu, one of two. Tag submenu, two of two. Category submenu, one of two. Submenu expanded, code things, one of three. Web life, two of three. And so I hope that through these past few minutes, I've given you something of a pathway to turn what often does feel like a terrible bag of spanners into a reusable toolkit that you can actually make sense of. Accessibility is an amazing thing when you get it right. And to return to almost the first idea that I mentioned, we all have a responsibility to do it. And it feels really good when you get it right. So please remember when you next get out and start coding in whatever fashion and on whatever thing that may be, that if you can remember how accessibility mechanics work, the importance of semantics and how and where they're provided, the need for the right interaction support to be provided, and that if you construct all of those things together, you can create some really great interfaces that people will be successful at using, enjoy using, and all of those really good things. And then you know what? You can put on a smile and head out of work at the end of the day knowing you've done the best job you possibly can. Thank you very much for listening.